very honored and pleased to introduce the Honorable Joe Biden, the Vice President of the United States. I'm so pleased to see you back here in Davos because I remember before you assumed your position as Vice President of the United States, you came here as a senator, you came here as the Chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee of the Senate, and I have to say, in my memory, you were one of the most engaged and hardest working participants here at the annual meeting. I, I watched you uh, in the morning up to midnight sometimes, one engagement after the other one. Of course, we welcome you now as the Vice President of the United States, as someone who has shown leadership, as someone who has had a privileged position to observe and to shape our global destiny. So we are very eager to hear from you. Um, the fourth industrial revolution has one big challenge. It is the holding out of the middle class, which is a pillar of our democracies. So without further ado, please give a big hand to the Vice President of the United States, Joe Biden. Thank you. I've been asked to uh, I've been asked to speak uh, about this year's topic, and Dr. Schwab, I'm flattered you'd ask me to keynote. Uh, there's an expression in my old neighborhood back in the United States. This may be above my pay grade. It's not above yours, though. You've written extensively on the topic that you've asked me to speak to: mastering the fourth industrial revolution. This fora. This uh, defines uh, that as uh, change fueled by a digital revolution. Technologies emerging and intersecting at exponential speed and scale, dramatically, dramatically increasing and improving productivity and economic growth, and creating, God willing, better jobs and, and entirely new industries. But there are two questions, it seems to me, that we have to address forthrightly at the outset. First, will this revolution actually transform the global economy? And secondly, if it does, will it be for the better or for worse for humanity as a whole? On the first question, there are some serious experts, some of you in the audience, who say that the technological advances we see are impressive but mostly inconsequential to the overall economy. Some of you argue that they won't lead to greater productivity or better jobs or wages for workers. For developed countries, the argument goes, a sluggish economic growth will be the new normal. And so get used to it. But I think, I think those who have that view are mistaken. I think we're already seeing how digital advances are not only impressive, but also consequential. We're on the cusp of many new and anticipated breakthroughs, enabled by enormous advances in computing power, big data sharing in real time, a billion billion calculations per second. On the second question, I believe on balance, these transformations are changes for the good for average people around the world. They bring exciting new choices to consumers, new kinds of jobs, hopefully, hopefully, that are good paying for workers. Market, uh, market makes uh, services more affordable. Astounding breakthroughs in science that are going to save lives and physical sciences and unleash entire new industries. My guess is that this revolution is going to require governments to refocus on core obligations. And international corporations to take a hard look at their corporate culture. 
with the recognition that their obligation goes beyond their shareholders to workers and to communities like it used to. In my country, there's been an emergence about six, uh, eight years ago of a phrase, job creators. The job creators today are thought, many in my country, as the stockholders. What about the woman on the assembly line making the product? What about the salesperson who sells the automobile or the refrigerator or the product made? What about all those people in the chain? They used to be job creators and viewed that way. There used to be, Mr. President, a sense of obligation to communities. It's not that corporate America or international corporations are bad. They're not. Things have changed. Short-termism is the order of the day. As I said, I know, like many of you assembled here, a significant number of presidents of the Fortune 500 companies. I remember standing on a platform, taking the train from my home constituency in Wilmington, Delaware in 2008, and the chairman of the board of one of the major corporations in America on the platform going to New York. But I said, how are you, John? He said, fine. I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to New York. I'm going to meet with some snivelly little guy on Wall Street who's going to tell me that I have to increase profitability in the next quarter or I will be downgraded. So it's going to require me to make, and he then started naming short-term decisions that were not in the interest of the long-term interest of his company. Now, a lot of you corporate leaders don't like me saying that, but you know it's true. It's not the sole problem. It may not even be the major problem. I'm going to be somewhat presumptuous, and I think there are at least five guideposts, five things we should be preparing to do now, follow through on, to take control of this revolution. There are many more than I'm going to name, I expect, and some of you may have better ideas, but in order to expand middle-class opportunities, for workers, I think it's going to require governments, corporations, and civil societies to make some of these changes. First, there is a need worldwide for an increase in access to affordable education and job training. It is more needed today than ever in our history. Cognitive capability as opposed to brawn, is the means by which you can climb that ladder into the middle class. When I say education, I'm talking about education that is early, lifelong, affordable, and accessible. Today's economy, there's going to be a constant requirement for workers to retool, retrain, for even for the very jobs they possess. Because the technology that they're engaged with is moving far beyond the ability to keep up with whatever the basic education they have is. The jobs they protest, possess, particularly in areas of IT, advanced manufacturing, healthcare, energy, are going to need lifelong education. Secondly, we need to continue to ensure basic protection for workers as these changes take place. I mean a living wage, payment of overtime, child care, sick leave, the right to unionize, to collectively bargain. Governments have, in my view, an obligation to strengthen these core protections. But so do companies. I don't have to tell anyone in this room that over the last few decades, there's been a real change in the culture. A lot of you have written and spoken about short-termism that undermine the long-term growth of company and stifle workers. Another change in the corporate culture that's happened over the last two decades, for example, a study done by, published in the Harvard Business Journal about eight months ago by a distinguished professor, pointed out in the last few decades, the last decade, 449 companies in the S&P 500 
over a 10-year period from 2003 to 2012, made $2.4 trillion in profit. That's good, obviously. But it was different than what happened 20 years ago. The difference is the way they invested that profit. 54% of you bought back your own stock. 37% of that profit went to shareholders, the job creators, leaving 9% for research, development, cash reserves, raises and training for employees. It worked because money was cheap to be borrowed, essentially zero interest rates. But it hasn't grown much. As a consequence, it added to the problem of stagnant wages, reduced productivity for workers, and less investment in the future. Thirdly, we have to modernize our infrastructure. In the United States, the reason for the exponential growth in the 1800s and early 1900s was the massive investment we made in technology. From the Transcontinental Railroad, the Erie Canal, a thousand things we did. And the government, the government, as a consequence, with this infrastructure, opened up vast opportunities. As you know better than I, companies locate where they get the raw materials the quickest to the factory floor and their product quickest to market in the cheapest way. World-class infrastructure attracts businesses and workers. These investments create a virtuous, a virtuous cycle. Decent, good-paying, middle-class jobs generating new jobs. And in far too many of our countries, we've not invested enough in infrastructure. Let me be parochial for a moment and speak to my country. For 90% of Americans, one out of every $7 they spend in their income goes to transportation costs. Yet our economy loses $120 billion a year in fuel costs to lost productivity due to traffic jams amounting to $118 per U.S. consumer. The American Society of Engineers estimates that there's a need to invest $3.6 trillion by 2020, which we're not going to do, to modernize and upgrade our infrastructure. The fourth point I'd make, and it's going to make some of you not happy with me, if you're not already, is we need, not only in my country, but in other countries, a more progressive tax code not confiscatory policy, not socialism, a tax code. Everybody pays proportionally a fair share. This is not meant to penalize anybody. I kid with my wife, Jill, I say, I dream that someday one of my kids would grow up to be a billionaire. Instead, one became the attorney general, the other is in the refugee camps and outside of Amman, working for World Food Program, and the other one is a social worker. I should have had one enterprising young Republican who became made a lot of money, so when they put me in a home, I at least have a window with a view, you know? But all kidding aside, in my country, when we talk about this, you hear this about wealth envy. There is no wealth envy. But the President and I have worked to make sure that everyone pays their fair share so that we can invest in the things that will grow the economy that benefit everyone. Lastly, we need to expand access to capital. The fact of the matter is that there are a lot of experiments many of you have been involved in, microcapital, that uh, has, uh, has generated some real uh, some real growth in areas that have changed people's lives. And uh, I'm calling on all of you to help make existing capital and the tools that support entrepreneurship more widely available, more widely available to people who haven't, ac haven't ad had access to it before. I know this is not simple. I know it's a complicated subject. Warren, a, a full day discussion. We've got to figure out how to make more capital available. Folks, in a strange sense, it's really all not that complicated. 
education and job training, infrastructure, worker protections, fair progressive tax code, access to capital. The President and I have uh, been laser focused on these, each of these issues because we know they're among the surest pathways of the middle class in advanced economies and to generate advanced economies. They've been the foundation of our road from economic crisis to recovery to hopefully permanent resurgence. For developing nations, they're part of other critical factors in building strong economies and societies like protecting basic liberties to think and speak freely, upholding the rule of law, ensuring access to health care. One of the best quotes of Steve Jobs ever when asked, what can I do to be more like you, Mr. Jobs, at Stanford University, a student asked. He looked down and he said, think different. You can only think different where you can breathe free. I think we have to get back to more of the basics. No fundamental radical change. But get back to some of the basics. And ladies and gentlemen, the unraveling of the middle class is not only uh, threatens our share of economic growth, but I would argue it threatens our shared global security. I'll conclude with this point. Thank you all for indulging me. I appreciate it very much.